I'm continuing with what we studied, at least began studying last week, Sunday afternoon, and we were into the matter of uh, what the Bible teaches concerning the work of elders, the relationship of the elders to the church, the church to the elders. You know, we wouldn't know there is such a thing as elders or presbyters or pastors. They're all different terms referring to the same people, if the Bible didn't tell us so. We wouldn't know anything about the qualifications, if the Bible didn't tell us so. We wouldn't know anything about their work if the Bible didn't teach us. And you know, that's the same thing about everything else pertaining to Christianity. You wouldn't know about the plan of salvation if you didn't know what the Bible said. So when you study about deacons, same thing's true. And so you have elders who superintend or oversee or shepherd the flock. You have uh, deacons to serve. You have evangelists to preach the word, Bible class teachers, all the members, their various capacities and talents, faithful to God and doing the will of heaven. And all in all, the great work of the church, each one of us making up the church, any Christian as the Bible defined and uses that term, all involved in the salvation of souls. It's God's will, it's in His wisdom that He's placed the gospel into our hands. As we sing sometimes, into our hands the gospel is given. So it is the work of the church once we've been redeemed and obeyed the gospel and added to the church by our Lord. Then we are to do the work of the church. If the church doesn't do the work God obligated it to do, it will not be done. And we might remember, and it seems some have forgotten this or never knew it, that God only receives glory from the church. People may do a whole lot more as far as money to spend or whatever they engage in. And it may do a lot of good for the people they spend it on. But they get no glory. That is, God doesn't get any glory from that. God gets glory from people who do what He says and the way He says it for the reason He says it. That's faithful living. And that's what needs to be kept in mind. If you let the world do what the world does, it'll always appear on the surface to outdo the church. Always will. But there was only one Christ. And all the world around him was just what it was in need of redemption, lost in sin. Only he could do what needed to be done. And so it is the spiritual body of Christ of which we're members in particular. There is laid upon our shoulders as the church is organized to carry out the will of heaven. We are the hands of the Lord. We are the feet of the Lord. We are the mouth of the Lord. And the Lord will not do what He's commissioned us to do, what He's obligated us to do. So when it comes to elders, deacons, the organization of the church, when it comes to the worship of the church, the acts of worship, all that's because we've studied our Bible. And we love God. And to prove it, we keep His commandments. And in so doing, we mold and make our character after His will. It's the way it works, and it doesn't work any other way. So in general, elders are to see that each member of the congregation does only what is authorized by the New Testament, omitting things that the New Testament prohibits, and then in the area of options, seeing that the best job done, that is the best option to do it with, to discharge the obligation, is chosen. I want to emphasize this. You can't begin to talk about expediencies, which means there's an advantage to use this way over another, if you don't have first an obligation. You can't do it. In the home, independent, separate, apart institution from the church, as God organized it, the head of the house, the husband, has an obligation. It's not the obligation of the wife and the mother. Neither is the obligations of the wife and the mother the same as the husband. But when we don't do what the Bible says in discharging those obligations, no use talking about what's expedient, what's the best option. You're not even willing to do what the Bible obligates you to. And no good talking about, well, what's the best option to choose for me to be baptized when I'm not willing to be baptized, which is the obligation. Ridiculous to talk about uh, the best place to bury a person in water to be saved, and the person doesn't believe you have to be buried in water to be saved. So there's the obligation that says you must do that. God's decided all that for us. In the very steps of the plan of salvation, God's decided that for us. When it comes to baptism, we know we have to be buried in water. 
as far as the mode of baptism. So in choosing a place to bury a person in water, there may be several options. But you can't discuss those until you got a person who wants to obey God and be buried in water. And that's just the way it is, whether it's how you serve the Lord's Supper. The obligation is in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, one of the acts of worship is to take the Lord's Supper. Well, how do you serve it? Would you have everybody just come up and take of it here? You could, couldn't you? Oh, by the way, back a long time ago, when people did things in the acts of worship, many churches saw fit to have the brethren all file by and make their contribution in one place. Well, I think people, some people not knowing how the Bible authorizes the different obligation and uh, expedient, they'll be horrified. <laughs> well, getting it done. <laughs> Maybe more horrified than people seeing them do it. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's a way to do it. So you've got to understand, there is the obligation. God in His Word sets out the obligation. Nobody decides that. They just have to make up their mind whether they're going to do it or not. Be saved or not be saved. Once you've understood the obligations God and His Word lays upon us, then we figure out what's the best way to get it done, and that gets the area of options and choosing the option that best expedites or makes advantageous the getting done of the obligation or the discharge of the obligation. So one of the great things that elders have to do is see that the church doesn't bypass those obligations. Besides, once... The obligations are there, which we all know is in the authoritative will of Jesus, our Savior, in the New Testament. Then decide which is the best way to do it. You know, there'd be not a thing in the world wrong if you had the pulpit in a circle right there and all the pews all the way around it. You know, I could just talk like this, talk like that, talk like this. Well, but just, I'm not used to that. Have you ever noticed in the last 30 years how many things we weren't doing those old ones to know it 30 years ago that we sure have got used to it's done now? Well, some of us won't go there, buddy, but so when it comes to computers. But <laughs> the point is, we get used to everything else in the world that expedites things better. You know, used to, the only way you drove a nail was with a hammer and driving it. You ever watch some of these automatic nail drivers? Can you see somebody that's a carpenter? I'm not going to use those things. But it sure expedites the work. And that's the whole idea. See, the obligation is still there. Drive the nail. Well, now you get it done a whole lot faster. And the whole manner of things are like that. Well, bring it over to going to heaven. Their obligations don't change. They've been set since the New Testament was preached and then set in words ever since it was put down. Completed. All sorts of things change. Those obligations don't change. But I'd like to see you preach the gospel over the radio in 1900. I'd like to see you teach the gospel over the internet in 1990. But we sure are doing a lot of that kind of thing today. Well, if you don't change, there's only one way you can preach the gospel. And that's like I'm preaching right now to the people who hear me, and I can't even use that. Because I don't think Paul ever knew what one of those was. So we've got to think, and we've got to realize we think in the light of the Word of God, knowing the difference in obligatory matters and things not obligatory, or what is explicitly in just so many words prohibited. That is, thou shalt not. So elders have to know the authority and respect of Jesus in His Word and how to ascertain that authority and to make sure the church abides by that authority. If they don't do that, let me ask you something. What are they there for? Because, you see, they can't even do their work in determining which option is the most expedient option if they don't have an obligation. So what are they there for? And the deacons, what are they there for? Because the elders delegate to deacons work to be done and you can see that throughout the Bible as to servants. The diakonos means people who hasten to get the work done. They hasten so fast, they're kicking up dust in the hills. 
That's just the way it works. A whole lot of things that are fundamental, basic, and first principle, we don't recall to mind when we're trying to determine what's right and what's wrong. That's just the way it works. So elders are to watch over the souls put under their charge. The end being their eternal salvation in heaven. Well, I think I can get to heaven on my own. Well, God seems to think there ought to be elders that met such qualifications and have a certain work to do to help you get to heaven. Now, if elders won't help you get to heaven, then they're not elders that are approved of God. But if they're going to help you get to heaven, they've got to help you according to the authorized will of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, for they're under shepherds. So these things must always be on the elders' minds and doing what they do and how they do it and the reasons they do it. Church elders are to keep the church pure and protected from false teachers, whether they come from without or within. Acts 20, 28 through 32, Paul addressed the elders at Ephesus and made that very clear. And he told Titus the same thing in giving part of the qualifications of elders in Titus 1, verses 9 through 11. In fact, if you read that, he'll tell you that uh, certain ones who teach false doctrine, he says elders are to stop their mouths. As one preacher said, elders are mouth stoppers. That's part of their work. Well, I don't like that. Well, just take your scissors and cut that out of your Bible. See how it works for you on day of judgment. Therefore, the elders are instrumental in the first line of defense and keeping each member of the church, they superintend faithful to the Lord. Thus, elders are to lead the church in preventive discipline, which is the teaching of the truth, making sure the brethren know what it is to become a Christian. They should know that. And to live the Christian life, the work, organization, worship of the church. That's the preventive discipline, teaching and training. And then corrective uh, discipline. That's when you know what's right and you deviate from it. That's what parents engage in a whole lot with their children. You knew better than that. Well, why would you say that to them if they didn't? When you say you knew better than that to your children, they had been instructed, they had been told, they had been taught a certain thing. And they deviated from it. And you thought you loved them when you disciplined them and brought them back to where they ought to be in rearing them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The New Testament has much to say about the faithfulness or purity of the church, the importance of it, how the members are to work and to keep it pure. You see, you as a member of the church in your capacity, you have just as much an obligation to keep this church pure as anybody else in doctrine and in the practice of every member. Sometimes I think people get the idea that I'm just to sit here and do what I am. Somebody else is supposed to do all this. Well, if you, if you concluded that, come and show me from the Bible where you're not concerned about the members. And yet I see every place I've ever preached, some people don't stay too concerned about any other member as to what they do, how they do it, where they are, what they're interested in. You don't see it. They can miss church for weeks. And somebody says, where has so-and-so been lately? Well, he died three months ago. We had his funeral. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's like stretching it to make a point. That we don't pay attention to one another, folks. You know, we fuss all about parents not paying attention to their kids. Well, we're children of God. But we're mature enough to know His will concerning my love for you and your love for me and our care one for another to keep us walking the straight and narrow way. And you know, just like some kids, they, they're more obedient and get along better than others. But there's always some kids who are forever getting into some mess. You think it's any different in the church? If you do, I don't know where you're living. So in view of the place and work of elders, they play a significant and leading role in the shepherding of each church member under their care with the express purpose to keep every one of them faithful to the Lord and to keep the church pure. Some of you may someday be elders. And then what are you going to do? <laughs> How are you going to take care of, of everybody? One of the things that bothers me is some elders, uh, which really would make them not elders, just kind of take the eldership as this light thing. It's just sort of like a cheerleader group. Uh, well, they haven't read their Bible. If they did, they didn't understand what they read about the qualifications of work of elders. Paul wrote to Timothy, and so he instructs all members in their various capacities of service to the Lord concerning living godly lives. 
And he said, now watch, this is living in the church. There's a certain way to live if you're a Christian. And he says, but if I tarry long, in other words, if I, I, I'm a long time getting there, let me tell you, if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Now what at least some things, what do I learn from this? There's a certain way one ought to live in the church. Which means there's a certain way you ought not live if you're a member of the church. There's a certain way one ought to live in the church, and it's Paul who makes it clear that one must be taught how to live as one ought to live in the family of God. Furthermore, the scriptures are by no means silent about how to deal with church members who do not live as they ought. Let me ask you this. The children who are your children that you loved and brought into existence, or when you were being raised in your family, could you live just any way you wanted to in your family? Or was there a certain way you ought to live in your family? Well, you'll have to answer that. But God already knows what you're thinking, so he's already got the answer. Of course you discipline your children, teaching, training them, setting a godly example. And then you make sure they live within those parameters of right living. That's the way they ought to live. Well, God knows how his children ought to live. And he's put into place things to make sure they do. But sometimes there's those children who are derelict in their duty. And the church will always have to face that. And never will be pleasant. I never liked it when I really got some severe punishment from my father. You know, I just don't ever remember a time that I thought, that man hates me. He's looking for an opportunity to kill me. And he wants, to, he wants to nail me to a cross so I can suffer the most. And he brought me into this world just to kill me. I'm sorry if people had that thought cross their mind. Maybe there are some parents who are that way. I'm sure there are. But I never did. I knew when I'd done wrong. He never would admit it. But I knew I got what I deserved. And then what you find out, see, here's how you know that. Years later, when they're grown they start telling you these little things they never confess to you while they're still at home. <laughs> so there's a, a way to live in the church that not just any way, but there's a way you ought to live. In view of the work of elders superintending the church Jesus built and purchased with his own blood, if they're true to the work as God ordained them to do, then they'll have a leading role in dealing with how brethren ought to live. And when necessary, correcting those members who have chosen not to live as they ought, you wouldn't think God, His infinite wisdom, who gave His Son to die for us, would say, here is the standard how you ought to live. And then when we don't, that doesn't make any difference. That doesn't even stand to reason, just from a cursory reading of the Bible, either Old or New Testament. It may be that a brother in Christ sins against another church member. Originally, that sin's known only to the two members involved and God. May the only one know anything about it. The New Testament's clear as to the process and the steps involved therein in settling the matter according to God's will in that given situation. Jesus gave it in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Christians are to do only that which the Lord has authorized them to do in this matter of Matthew 18, 15 through 17, as well as all other matters pertaining to life and godliness. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. It should be emphasized that our Lord's instructions, and please follow me, in Matthew chapter 18, listen, pertain to a personal sin involving originally only two brethren, the one who sinned and the one sinned against. This is not a procedure necessarily to be followed in the correction of public sin. False teachers, regardless of what kind, have always sought to prohibit faithful brethren from publicly exposing their errors by saying, you've got to first come to me privately to do it. But as I pointed out to them over all the years I've been preaching, you didn't come to me privately to ask if you could teach a false doctrine. This, if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth, if you're interested in context, and Jesus is saying you got a brother who sins against a brother. 
And here's the way to handle it. Because only God and those two know about it. This is not applied to a public sin. Not at all. So, they, the false teachers, have stated that to publicly call the names and refute their errors before personally coming to them in private to discuss their false doctrine violates the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. But that's not true because the context of Matthew 18, 15 through 17 means one brother sins against another brother. And if it's handled like God says, as Jesus taught in verses 15 through 17, then they both settle it right there. And it's never known beyond those two and God. The false teacher doesn't like that. All through the years of my preaching, and I can testify to this from any other preachers, various false teachers have, thought, have tried to stop any kind of public refutation of their error, no matter how publicly they taught it. I say, you've got to first come to me, or you can't refute it. They're simply taking Matthew 18, 15 through 17, rending it from its context and twisting it. That's all they're doing. So it's a gross twisting and misusing of it. I would suggest that if you read it and understand English, that just a cursory reading of Matthew 18 clearly establishes that this is the Lord's remedy for sins that begin with only two brethren. The one that uh, sinned against a brother and the brother sinned against. If each brother involved has the attitude of a Christian, then they're going to meet one another trying to settle the matter. Too many brethren aren't very interested in that. They just want their pound of flesh and their revenge and going about their way. Of course, as the Lord teaches in the passage, if the brother guilty of sin, having been properly approached by his brother whom he has sinned against, refuses to repent, then the other steps the Lord prescribes in Matthew 18 are to be taken to bring the brother to repentance or if he refuses to repent after all those steps have been taken that the church finally has to withdraw fellowship from that brother because the purity of the church becomes involved then and a little leaven, either for good or bad, leavens the whole lump. We have experienced brethren coming to the elders to inform them about a personal and private sin as the Lord described in Matthew 18. In various places we've experienced this where by the elders I was invited in on it. The offended brother had not gone to his offender as Matthew 18 talked about. But he came to the elders warning the elders to do something about the offending brother. However, the elders directed, and this is their job, the elders directed the sinned against brother to Matthew chapter 18. And told him he was not to come to them at this point, but to go privately to the offending brother and reconcile things as the Lord taught in Matthew 18. The elders could not say anything else. Because they had no word of God whereby to say anything else. But they certainly could direct one who's been offended by another brother. You followed what Jesus said in Matthew 18. If that didn't work to settle the matter, then the elders directed him. To continue to apply the process Jesus taught in Matthew 18. You know, we have no problem directing people who are not members of the church to show the steps and plan of salvation. Then why can't we understand the steps that are settled matters that begin between one brother offending another brother by sinning against him? Doesn't seem to be difficult to me, except what we can see in one area. Sometimes we're blind as a bat to any other area when it involves the same principles of understanding. Certainly, when it came down to the whole church being involved in a situation like this, then elders would be involved when it came to the whole church. In the process, when the whole church becomes involved, then the nature of the work of elders. And that final step, where there are elders of the church fully organized, as the New Testament teaches, would be involved. When sins in conduct or teaching are public sins, the inspired teaching for dealing with such is not found. In Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Now somebody might want to just use it, but they can't say there's the way it's done every time, public or private. You say that, you're making a law where God didn't make one. You're taking Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18 and saying it must be followed where a pub person is committed public sin. No, it must not. Paul did not follow it in dealing with the public sins of the church at Corinth. He based his letter on it hath been reported unto me by them which are of the household of Chloe. 
Now, he did tell the church where he got his information. That's exactly how he did it. Neither did Paul follow the directives of Matthew 18, 15 through 17 when he publicly named and admonished the two women at Philippi for their own conduct. Call her name the letter that's been around for 2,000 years. You know exactly those women's names. Philippians 4, 2. And you got to remember at that day and age, those letters circulated among the churches. So everybody in the first century church, even when those women were alive, where that letter went, they knew about that. The Apostle John didn't follow the same in calling the name of Diotrephes and his public sins in 3 John 9 and 10. So what we're saying is it's as wrong to apply a doctrine to all cases involving brethren's sins as it is to fail to apply it to remedy a certain kind of sin to which Jesus meant it to be applied. Charges brought against elders are not to be received except before two or more witnesses to the alleged sins. But those that sin are to be rebuked before all. Now how do I know that? Well, I can read. And Paul told Timothy himself, as a preacher, here's what you're to preach on this matter, and you're to see that this is the way the brethren act. 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20. Paul's directives to Timothy hardly match the teaching of the Lord regarding remedying the situation arising from one brother sinning against another, known only to them and God, and the process the Lord prescribes for handling such private sin. Assuredly concerning public matters of sin in the church where elders are in place, and in view of the work of elders, they would have a leading role in dealing with such public sins. Let me give an example. Now, if you thought I really meant this, and I say... If you're outside of Christ now, just believe only in Christ. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. Now, before the elders here could rise up and say, sit down, that's wrong. They got to come to me privately when people disperse. You know, some things don't just take a great amount of knowledge or right division of the word or how the Bible authorizes and our uh, ascertaining of that authority. Some things just mean some good old common sense to understand it. You take care of matters like that when they happen. You ever read Paul restanding a fellow apostle Peter to the face? And he said, I said before them all. He took care of it. Just exactly how it happened. And it wasn't a one-on-one, -on -one, privately known sin where one brother sinned against another brother, known only to them among men, and then God, of course. So where the church is not organized according to the New Testament, the faithful men of a congregation must lead the church in all things that pertain to life and godliness, including corrected discipline. And in all due respect, to Ben's business meetings. That's one of the poorest ways on the face of the globe to ever have to handle anything. But sometimes you're forced into it because the church is not fully organized because there are not men qualified to be elders. And you have no choice. And even then, brethren can seemingly go completely harebrained. They're just as apt to bring a 13-year-old a boy in who was baptized when he was 12 to handle adult matters. Let me tell you something. Someone may be baptized when he's 12, 13, or 14. That doesn't make him a mature adult. It makes him a Christian. But he's not an adult. He can't do the things adults can do. If he could, his own mama couldn't now even teach him any longer. But you see, just to be old enough to become a Christian doesn't make you old enough to be a mature adult. Again, common sense, folks. There's something kids... No matter how honest-hearted and good they are, doing their best, and you want to encourage them, they've obeyed the gospel, they're not mature enough to deal with a lot of problems that come along in the church. They shouldn't have the say of a man who's been faithful to God 30 years in the church. But I've seen wicked men bring in folks that hadn't attended church in a year in the business meeting. Because they made it a political thing, it's going to be a vote, and they got to bring in everybody that ever was baptized, though he hadn't attended in years, so they can get the majority vote, get done what they want. Well, anybody operating that way is lost anyway. I mean, there's no hope for them in heaven. They're ungodly. The church is worldly, and people stand in that mess. Well, they're just standing in that mess, waiting to go to hell. It's that simple. 
So the New Testament authorizes individual Christians to do what they can in teaching, taking care of orphans and widows and all those who cannot provide for themselves, but such is also to be done collectively by the church, according to James 1 verse 27. The church is to practice pure and undefiled religion. The Annies some years ago said, James 1 27 applies to the individual work of a Christian. It doesn't apply to the church. It didn't take... Uh, Genius to realize you just said the church collectively cannot practice pure and undefiled religion. And they can't get over it to this day. But they still believe it, which, doesn't, which ought to tell us that you can't change some people no matter what you do. If two or more Christians desire to work together to help others as a part of their individual service to God, they certainly can do it. But they shouldn't do things in such a way it takes away from where their membership is and the work there. You know, when you become a Christian, the Lord adds you to the church salvation-wise, the one body of Christ. But he did not organize the church universally. He organized it locally. And you see, there was a church in Rome and a church in Corinth and a church in Thessalonica and a church in Ephesus, a church in Antioch of Syria and a church in Antioch of Pisidia and so on. And there's a church in Spring, Texas. There is the level or the place where the church is organized that has elders and deacons and preachers and teachers. Not universally, but in geographic locations. In fact, if you think about how that the church is to come together into one place on the first day of the week to worship God, how would, you, how would the universal church do that? How would the universal church, to which we're all added if we obeyed the gospel, how would it all come together into one place? To worship God. Well of course not. But each congregation can. And that means. That's the assembly I'm not to forsake. And thus if I decide. Well I can just worship at home. Well if there is no faithful congregation. Anywhere around. You would be the church there. Worshiping wherever you are. But when there is a faithful congregation. You have an obligation to be there in that congregation. But that's the way the Lord organized the church. And that's the assembly you're forsaking, which is condemned in Hebrews 10, 25. And when one does it, they sin. If not, talking about meeting our needs, each family knows your personal needs better than everybody else. So just stay home. And wherever your house is, that's the church. It makes as much sense as some of the other stuff that's supposed to make sense, but doesn't. Elders are to remind members of your individual responsibility to your families. To abide by the role God gave you as a husband. And what is entailed in that role. And the same of a wife. And the same of father and mother. And they have a right because they're dealing with all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's the only place they do deal. And if rearing children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord is not pertaining to life and godliness, I would like to hear somebody explain how it's not. So when families, husband and wives, fathers and mothers, do not live up to the New Testament teaching on those matters, you better believe the elders have a right, not only a right, an obligation. To make sure that family is what it ought to be. If not, then evidently the home has nothing to do with things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you mean elders can't help fathers be better fathers? Do you mean elders can't help husbands to be better husbands? Now, it's rather interesting that sometimes people say, no, you can't do that. You're stepping outside your bounds. But when they want to come to the elders to get their elders' help, it's another story indeed. Well, if it is wrong for elders to guide the head of the house in matters pertaining to life and godliness, then it's wrong for them to expect the elders to come in and usurp their authority when they ask for it. Because they're asking for it doesn't change the authority of God's will. I'm telling you that rearing children, the nurturing and admonition of the Lord, is what the Bible teaches having to do with things that pertain to life and godliness. And elders can very well point out to husband, you are not being what New Testament says a husband ought to be. 
Bible says man won't work, neither should he. Now watch this simple syllogism. If a man won't work, neither should he eat. Peter won't work. Now what's your conclusion? Neither should he eat. Yeah, but the wife says, and we're talking about Christians, I love him, he's my husband. But I'm earning the money. We'll take your money, put it in the bank, don't let him have any sign, pre, signing privileges to it. Keep it away from him. Feed your kids. Let him starve. Oh, that's awful hateful. I love him. No, you don't. You've got an emotional attachment. If you love God and keep his commandments, you'll realize even your husband, the father of your children, if he won't work, not quote the scripture. They'll read that way and mean that way on their judgment, folks. Just like he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. Coming from the same inspired volume. Wives can help their husbands with tough love be what sometimes they won't be. Which God says they ought to be. I'm sorry some people just don't know their Bible or else don't believe it. And if they would give us a chance to sit down and talk to them, they might learn something. You mark it down, and the lesson is going to be yours. You mark it down. If somebody has a problem with you, and they accuse you of certain things, and you offer to sit down with him now and out, and they refuse to do it, if that doesn't send you a message about their seriousness and wanting to iron out that matter, then you don't get messages too well. If you have a valuation on the job and they tell you we need to visit about certain things that you need to correct and you say I'm not mean with you but they don't be surprised you get a pink slip if a husband and a wife one's having trouble with the other to make any difference which one and the other comes and says let's sit down honey or baby or whatever you coo over them with and let's work this out. And then say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to talk to you at all. Now let me ask you something. If they came to the elders because they purport to be Christians, and they asked, what should I do? The elders said, I can't say anything about that. You just have to go with the head of the house. Okay? Book, chapter, and verse, please. Direct statement, implication, or example, please. Brethren, some people speak through their hat not knowing the truth and they don't think anybody else been where they haven't been. And besides that, I know this. I can preach this sermon to every head of the house here. And if it's the truth, they better listen. <laughs> As we should from anybody. Well, if you're not a Christian, you're lost. You can't go to heaven. There's one place waiting on you when you die. And that's not a good thought. Never is a good thought. I spent my life trying to keep people from going to hell. That's what a gospel preacher does. And trying to keep those saved saved. I've always thought that was a good investment. And sometimes we say, well, teenagers can't really think too well. Well, I can remember I wasn't even a teenager when I obeyed the gospel. And I decided to preach for the reasons I just gave you when I was a teenager. So I think on some things they do pretty good thinking. Not because it's me. Because that's when they ought to make those decisions. Remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, and other days draw nigh. When I shall say, I have no pleasure in them. Now you apply that verse and tell me when it's first to be applied. It's like Daddy says, when you're old enough to get your eyes open. <laughs> when you're old enough to understand. And I'm glad I had some of that teaching when I grew up. It made a difference. Not that my mother and daddy were flawless and perfect. Not at all. None of us are. Well, they were hard workers and responsible people, and they knew right from wrong, and they intended us to try to live that way, whether when we got old enough to live on our own, we did or we didn't. <laughs> they were trying to do what they were supposed to do. Are you a Christian this afternoon? I think everybody here knows what to do to become a Christian if they're not. So maybe I ought to say, as Christians, are you living by the authority of the Lord's will? 
And if you're not, are you willing to admit you didn't know or you did and you crossed over the line and you'll repent and turn from that way and embrace the authoritative will of God and please your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Someday, all the stuff that troubles people is going to pale into insignificance. When you stand before the judgment bar of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be concerned about going to work in the morning. You're not going to be concerned about Social Security. You're not going to even be concerned about your health insurance or about any great flood. You're not going to be concerned about your dwelling place. When you stand before Jesus Christ to give a final accounting of your life in the light of the Word of God, a part of which will be there that we studied today, there will be one thing on your mind. Have I lived so as to please Him? Have I been faithful to Him? Have I demonstrated my love for Him by obedience to the truth? That's all that's going to be there. I don't know how it all works, but I know you'll be what you are when you get there. And that's what you are when you die or when He comes again. There will loom before us a vast eternity without end. And only two places to go to which we shall be assigned by the Lord of Lord and King of Kings and the Judge of all the earth. And shall He not do right? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Now you either believe that or you don't. You either live by it or you don't. You said when you obeyed the gospel, the rest of your life is going to be given over to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and being faithful to him till the end. Are you staying true to that? Do you believe it? Is that belief seen in your actions? So if you've deviated from those things, the answer is repentance, confession of sins, and praying God for forgiveness, and rising up to press the battle ere the night shall veil the lowing skies. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.